asked what year was the, there a notable increase in young men having ED? And so I know that's where you said that you would get me those dates and times. Yeah, and there's there's a couple. Well, I can speak to it though. So mm -hmm. um, basically, when high speed internet porn was introduced, that is when studies recognized that young men were struggling with erectile dysfunction more than ever in history. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that is, you know, approximately 1999 is when that happened and started. Um, so that correlation, it, it's high-speed internet mm -hmm. and erectile dysfunction that makes that correlation so strong. And it's very interesting because before that, you know, erectile dysfunction was considered to be an older man's issue mm -hmm. for physiological reasons. So, you know, that study shows that it really is more neurological in nature because it's not, it doesn't have to do with aging. It has to do with, in my um, estimation from my framework, it has to do with the way that a person's brain is performing and the damage, frankly, that's being done to the brain. Right. Okay. Very good to know. And so my second question going into that is, does ED have anything to do with hormones such as testosterone or prolactin? Because uh, when I was doing my own research on this, you know, when you think of an older man having erectile dysfunction, you think of them, they go on Viagra or the blue pill. And if I'm not mistaken, I mean, if I'm wrong, please correct me. But if mm. I think one of the main ingredients in the pill is, you know, like a hormone is, you know, it tries to increase your testosterone. But is that the same? Is it the same for these younger men or would a blue pill like would Viagra work for them or not? Yeah, for most people it does, but it doesn't solve the problem. So mm. at the root of the issue is neurological function. So my framework is electroencephalogram, EEG, but EEG, just so you know, maps onto fMRI, functional MRI. It's how the brain functions. It maps onto SPECT exams. So like any doctor that looks at brain performance, brain functioning, brain mm -hmm. physiology, not structure, like from any framework, there is a difference in the way that the brain is performing if it's subjected to frequency, consistency, and especially intensity of pornography mm. use. That's why that shift from, you know, magazines and dial up to high speed internet. And then especially when high speed internet came along, along came servers like Pornhub and that were capitalizing on that. So that's when it became frequent, consistent, and especially intensity was available. And the intensity pieces ramped up from there. And we can talk about that in yeah. a bit. But so like that is what changes the way that the brain uses electrical energy. And to, I can tell you how I simply tell it to people in the world, but then I can tell you kind of specifically, I call it a pendulum brain effect. Pendulum brain is what I call it. So it's a brain that's wired and tired. And we know this, it's proven. So it's too much fast energy and too much slow energy simultaneously. It's a brain that's using speeds out in the extreme the optimal brain performance pattern is a brain that's using the medium speeds of calm focus. So if your brain is in a calm focus mode, primarily using this medium speed in the day, mm -hmm. it's able to work properly in terms of circadian rhythms. So you get tired at night, you fall asleep. When you wake up, you're groggy, but then your brain comes online, you use it for calm focus. If a stressor comes in, you're able to react and respond to the stress, but then your brain comes down again and you're able to have dinner with your family and relax. And then you're able to go to bed and fall asleep. But when people consume pornography, what happens is the circadian rhythms are all, they're a mess because basically the brain's wired and tired at, at all times because it's going back and forth and using too much of these extreme speeds. And then now actually I'm building, I love research. I'm a, I'm a university professor by origin. So like, mm -hmm. I love the research part right now. I use EEG and I use home neurofeedback and I'm probably building one of the largest databases of porn brains, which is really wow. interesting to me. Someday I would love to be able to take that data and study it. But anecdotally, what I already know, and I'm, there's not science to prove it yet, there will be, is that 
when a person consumes a lot of pornography, basically it is, I'm going to answer your question. I still have the, the answer. Yeah, so just totally so you know, I'm absorbing it all. It, there's, there's a, I call it a dopamine deluge. There's tons of dopamine flooded the system. So the brain's wired and tired. Mm -hmm. Then they watch porn. The system gets flooded with dopamine. What the dopamine does is it increases that medium speed, not the focus, but the calm. And what, what the brains I've been looking at show is that that calm speeds off the charts and it gets stuck there. That's why people lose motivation. That's why they can't focus because they, they're basically flooding their brain with dopamine. Then they try to go back to their life after, you know, after their brain recovers, it goes back to a dopamine deficit state. So they have more anxiety, they have lack of focus. And then what happens is to answer your question about testosterone or hormones, when the electrical energy pattern is dysregulated, not healthy, it impacts the cascading of neurochemicals. It impacts the release of hormones. So like from the science on porn addiction, we know that it's decreasing functioning in the frontal lobe and the reward center in the brain is desensitized. That's why men struggle with erectile dysfunction. It's that desensitization of the reward center. They need, and do have you, have you heard me talk about this or do you know the science behind like why erectile dysfunction happens? I've done some research. Yes, I have. That's how I found your video. <laughs> yeah. YouTube, so like, yeah. you know, not only is it like depleting the system of testosterone or kind of working against the natural flow of all the chemicals in the body, it's basically like keeping the brain in this dysregulated state that is creating a ton of problems for people. Mm -hmm. okay. And so like, you know, testosterone's impacted, but this is my whole point. If you just take a testosterone supplement, you are not at all dealing with the actual issue, which is brain dysregulation. Right. It's like a band-aid. You're just putting it in. It's out, totally. Out yeah. So, and I call it a band-aid, you know, I call like all pharmaceuticals that people use a band-aid and then neurofeedback. What I offer, I call it stitches because basically what it does is it pulls the brain out of these extremes a day by day. It's a workout for the brain and it's helping to increase the amount that your brain's using optimal performance. But of course, mm -hmm. then you have to stay out of the screen and there's other things you have to do to rewire your brain. Absolutely. So and this is another question that I had that I was just thinking about when you were talking about this. You were talking about how your brain kind of gets stuck in this pattern. You lack that motivation. You can't, you are in that dopamine deficit. And mm -hmm. so what if somebody stops watching porn? Maybe they step away from that addiction. Is that something that they can still suffer from even if they're not in that addictive state? You know, what are, what's the long-term totally. effects on that? Yeah. And when it comes to erectile dysfunction, like, especially if you're interested, you know, in this, for this chapter in yeah. erectile dysfunction, I work with a lot of people who they haven't watched porn in three years, but they still struggle from erectile dysfunction. So the way I talk about it is like, when you step away from porn and you give your brain, you know, relief from that, you're no longer wiring your brain towards porn, but you're starting the unwiring process. And there's, there's two, the answer is twofold. Number one is most men who've watched porn for a long time internalize the fantasy. So mm -hmm. a client, a client of mine has said, it, I, I really love this quote where he goes, you put an alcoholic in a room for a month. He comes out sober. You put me in a room for a month. I come out the same or worse wow. because, you know, they have you for you euphoric recall it's called where they can just mm -hmm. recall the scenes in their mind and get almost the same level of stimulation as if they were watching it so mm -hmm. it's an internalized addiction so then mm -hmm. fantasy is one reason why people can't recover and the erectile dysfunction stays around the other reason is unwiring isn't rewiring so mm -hmm. neuroplasticity shows anybody's brain can be rewired to the optimal mode but okay you have to do all the right things. And so, right. you know, I always say neuroplasticity is your best friend or your worst enemy, depending upon what you're doing. And so like a lot of people don't rewire their brain. They just figure out how to stay out of the screen, but they don't actually take the steps to unwire the porn brain and rewire the healthy brain. That's why I think brain training is such an effective way to do that. Um, right. But they're not replacing those habits. It's like, they're just taking it out. So that there's just like a gap in oh, with their life and their brain versus adding something back in. That's a positive 
impact. Yeah. On. So that's yeah. what you're saying. And kind of like, it's so deep. This thing's so deep. I don't know if you know how mm -hmm. crazy layered this thing is. Like, that's what I, it's fascinating and terrifying about it. Mm -hmm. But so like, mm -hmm. there's two things there too, is that yes, like at the core of actually recovering and rewiring the brain is you have to have healthy mood regulation. So mm -hmm. when people find porn, they're 13. Well, actually now we know it's between eight and 11. So we'll, we'll, you know, we'll just go with 13 for the sake of not freaking most people out is that right. when they find it, they're 13 years old. So basically it becomes the tool to de-stress and fill boredom, mm -hmm. mood regulation. And then they grow up. And this is the part that I don't know if you're aware of and science mm -hmm. supports this is like they find porn at 13, the seeds of addiction are planted Mm -hmm. And then they continue to water it. So many men's brains are stunted in development. We know this from the science. So like basically they're using the 13 year old brain pattern, which is different from the healthy adult brain functioning pattern. Our, our brains develop, men's brains develop until 28. Mm -hmm. And, and what I'm talking about is using those speeds. Young brains use a lot more of that slow speed. That's why fantasy mm. is easier for men who've been watching porn because that slow speed is associated with fantasy. As you grow up, like you, you know, your imagination unfortunately goes down a little bit and more of that mm. practical calm focus sets in because you're using an adult brain. So that is one of the reasons is that the brains have never developed properly. And if you stay out of the screen, you have to take the steps to grow the brain up. Yeah. So it's not it's necessarily true. total, totally just mood regulation, but it's like there's strategies that we can use to unlock the neuro rigidity and create more neuroplasticity, but then do many of the right things. And it includes, you know, creating a whole toolbox of mood regulation. It also includes figuring out how to have healthy sexuality, which most men who've watched porn for a long time have no clue because all they know is porn, porn informed sex, not sexuality that includes intimacy as its primary function right and using a partner you know it's just solo it's like the solo sex I, in my first chapter that's what I talked a lot about I was like you're all of a sudden just removing a whole nother person out of the bedroom and you're relying on yourself to engage in intimacy I mean that's just that you're at already at a huge deficit of that's the need you know there's a biological need to have the partner there so that's there is. And, you know, I, I remind men that all the time. I'm like, I feel the need right now to remind you, especially when it comes to like some haters, porn isn't sex with a partner. Like, cause they're like, you know, sex is good for you. It's evolutionary. I'm like, yeah, but porn isn't sex, my friend. And, you know, so that, that is a really, really important piece. And, you know, if you have a partner, like I talked to someone yesterday, but this someone is representative of basically everybody I work with that has a partner. You know, he said that he had a girlfriend and he was transparent with her about the porn addiction and that he was trying, mm -hmm. but he wasn't succeeding. And two years later, she left because it was too much for her to handle. And he has a new girlfriend. And he's been lying to her. She doesn't know he has a porn problem. And he's like, but it's like eating me alive. He's like, I didn't realize how much shame and how different I am when I lie to my partner. I'm like, I, I said, I know this is a no win situation partner, whether you lie, whether you tell the truth or whether you have a partner or not. It creates, you know, it's not a healthy habit. We know this. It creates guilt. It creates shame, especially when most men end up because of the dopamine and escalation and tolerance, they go into genres or they go into acts that create that even if they don't have a partner, it creates the guilt and shame. And that adds another, you know, layer to the healing aspect. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Wow. That's just a lot of good stuff too that I haven't, I have you know, been researching some of this, but as you said, there's just so many deep layers that you just can, obviously that's how you can make a whole livelihood of just researching it it's just because the more information that comes out, the more information that you research, the more aware you are, but also with our society being more driven by the internet, you know, I feel like that's just going to produce even more information for us. I mean, it's just a whole nother world, especially with AI. I feel like that's going to introduce probably a whole nother realm of pornography it already it there. already has i don't know if you know like tiktok mm -hmm. yes. um for mm -hmm. example you know they use eye 
um, eye scanning technology so they can tell where your eyes have landed longer and they'll keep serving you up more and more of that. Mm -hmm. And we know it's mostly used as sexual media by men who are on oh. TikTok. So um, yeah, absolutely. You know, so like they're already using that AI to, to basically extort the notion that, you know, this is what it's being used for and capitalizing on having men use it for that reason more and more and more. Yep, absolutely. All right. So my second or my third question actually was why is DE less common than e ED? Um, so I've been doing a lot of research and everything that comes up is always erectile dysfunction, but not delayed ejaculation. But I do know that that delayed ejaculation is still a common, you know, and it is a correlation with porn use. So why is that? Why is the body, you know, not show? Why is that not as common? Yeah, I'm it's the brain. It's the brain, just so you know. So um, mm -hmm. going back to like just talking about what ED is in the brain. So mm -hmm. if a man is watching just to, again, I will get to the answer. I'll try not to make it too long, but just to frame it, because I think it helps you understand is that mm -hmm. what ED is, is that you're watching scenes that are so intense that, you know, and I'm just going to make these numbers up. Actually, I tried to squeak the numbers out of Anna Lemke, who wrote Dopamine Nation, but I couldn't get her to commit because she didn't have the science for the numbers. Uh -huh. She had the science for sex, but not this, the numbers for porn in terms of the amount of dopamine that's released. Okay. So like the point is like sex with your partner is at, we'll just say it's at a level 25. Mm -hmm. Super intense porn is at a level 100. So if you watch intense porn and your brain is used to getting level 100 of dopamine, and mm. now you go to try to be with your wife of 20 years, and she could be the most gorgeous thing in the world. So many men tell me my wife is drop dead gorgeous, but I can't get aroused with her because even mm. a drop dead gorgeous woman can't compete to what they're watching on the screen because no healthy mm. woman wants to engage in the acts that men are watching in porn. That's just, that's proven. We know that. So mm -hmm. like the point is the brain is accustomed to getting 100 level of dopamine for long, long times to be able mm -hmm. to reach arousal and to reach ejaculation. Now you're asking the brain to get aroused and ejaculate at 25 dopamine, which is nowhere near the amount that the brain needs to be able to get there. Wow. So like, yeah. this is the thing I wanted to, you know, really hone in on erectile dysfunction happens for these men with their partners, not when it comes to porn use. So mm. unfortunately, so many of these men will run porn scenes in their mind while they're with their partner. And I know partners, you know, partners hate when I, they loathe when I say that on videos, but like, it's just the reality. So when I work with men, it's like, there's no fantasizing. Because what has to happen is you have to retrain your brain to be able to get there at level 25, because level 25 is healthy dopamine with a combination mm -hmm. of serotonin and oxytocin for happiness and connection. Sex is supposed to be fun and engaging, just not just pleasure seeking. Dopamine is the pleasure seeking neurochemical. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to delayed ejaculation, mm -hmm. that is also like, it can be like, if you follow those breadcrumbs, like delayed ejaculation is that a person can't get there in right. the amount of time. So like either they can't get aroused or they just can't get there with their partner. That's what the, the DE is, is like, there's no amount of time unless they, what some men do is they will like try to, and actually I think this is a good strategy if you can make it healthy in the end, but when men cross over into a, when they cross a barrier, they'll try to get their partner to do the things to arouse them because mm. they're, they have anxiety about delayed ejaculation or about erectile dysfunction. Like it, but mm -hmm. they're, my point is they're basically the same mechanism. The brain can't get there with a human partner. Well, hmm. And so you're, I guess, just to clarify, you're saying that if you follow the breadcrumbs, you see that delayed ejaculation is less because people can't even get to the point of keeping an arousal. So you don't even know those statistics because you can't even get to the first step that you need for, you know, completion. So, okay. Yeah. 
That makes so sense. So yeah. less men less men struggle with delayed ejaculation because it's a byproduct of arousal. They're both arousal dysfunctions, but right. the but the one kind of supersedes the other. But they're both a huge problem for actual mm-hmm. healthy sexuality. So when I'm helping men and partners, when I'm helping people to rewire their brains to be together again, like that can kind of be a slow boat to China after after men figure out how to stay away from porn, they have to figure, Mm -hmm. they have to give their brain time and practice. Like, and that's Mm -hmm. why if you take Viagra, you're not allowing the brain the opportunity to practice getting aroused with your partner again. Mm. So like one, one, one gentleman I worked with, he was a perfect example. And it's interesting because like, this has happened to me before in my life with research, like you know, up front, the research was really important to me, but now I know what I know. And mm-hmm. I kind of stopped looking in, I would, I would go to truthaboutporn.org. Do you know that website? I'd go yeah, there yeah. all the time and like read every single, every day I'd read a new research article, but mm-hmm. now I've kind of like shifted into, I know so many people's realities that mm-hmm. I stopped looking at the science because the reality is, it is what it is. Like you want the truth about porn comes from the thousands of people I've talked to now, you know? And so my, my, my example about that is, you know, there's one gentleman, but again, one of a million who, you know, has been using Viagra and can't even like be with his wife, Mm. even with Viagra, it's not working like it used to because the brain's going to hit thresholds there too. And the brain's never been healed. It's never been healed. So like you literally have to heal your brain Mm. or you, you will not be able to, um, you know, for arousal in the future and staying out of porn and healing the brain are two different things. Mm, mm-hmm. Well, and you're talking about how these men can fantasize. So they'll just put a fantasy basically over top of their sexual encounter with their partner. So how do you get to that point where you just take out that fantasy? You know, what's the process of basically eliminating that out of their you know, sexual practice, 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 practice. And I use, you know, I use a lot of snappy analogies or maybe not so snappy, but I make these analogies up to help people understand. So, you know, that is when, when a man is with their partner, they'll feel themselves coming in and out of reality and fantasy. It's being Mm -hmm. present versus drifting off. And, you know, it's like meditation, it's, it, and that's why I tell, I tell men, like, you can use your sexual experiences, like kind of like a meditation where when you feel yourself drift off, pull yourself back. And honestly, mm-hmm. partners can feel it too. Partners know, like right now he's with me and we're connected right now. He's just trying to get the highest level of pleasure using me, objectifying mm-hmm. me. And that means he's off doing his own thing in his mind. So it's like, you know, I encourage people to schedule when they're going to be together as unromantic as that sounds. But if you schedule it, then you basically learn to, you know, turn on sexuality, not use sex as a mood regulation tool, because a lot of people just swap out their partner for porn. When they stop watching porn, anytime they're feeling stressed, they just will go to have sex with their partner. It's reinforcing those old neural pathways. Mm -hmm. So when you schedule Mm -hmm. it, like I have to go from not being aroused to being aroused, that's how you practice. And you practice by doing arousing things with your partner and staying present. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that's not going to happen on the first week that might happen on the 10th week or the 172nd week. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. That makes sense. And I don't know if this is true or not. I've just heard this. I don't really have statistics on it, but I've heard that women typically are the type of people where they are even when they're engaging in a sex that they just they their mind can wander you know what whether it's their grocery list or the things that they've got to do throughout the day and so that's interesting because you always think of the man being so locked in and focused but this is such a, a counterintuitive type of thought to say oh no actually the man's the one that's not present you know he's just using this as a means to an end it's so dynamical and when porn mm-hmm. enters like it's so hard. There's so many working pieces. This is what I know. And mm-hmm. again, this is supported by science. Right. People who, they don't even know they have a porn addiction. Just people who have a porn addiction end up choosing partners that are the perfect partner to keep a porn addiction going. It's wild. Wow. So like 
that type of partner is going to be the type that like, and, and, and women in general anyways, are kind of trained to be codependent, try to, you know, Mm -hmm. are people pleasing. Mm -hmm. Like, so the point is like a woman might know that it's distorted and something's up and they don't know it's necessarily porn. But my point is like the dynamics of the sexual relationship start to break down and porn is a major reason why. Because if it wasn't in the relationship, the relationship would be able to build healthy sexuality. But the longer that, you know, we'll just say men, because this is how I talk about it. Mm -hmm. The longer the man watches porn, the more distorted the sexual relationship becomes. And then, you know, some of the men haters will be like, you're blaming, you know, you're, you're letting the women off the hook. But like the woman's running her grocery list because sex became no fun for her about three years ago or because she feels like, she's just a sexual object being used by her partner. And a lot of women feel that way. Mm. Once it hits a, again, like this whole thing hits a tipping point before that it could be a fun sexual relationship, but the partner thinks it's authentic, not that porn's in the mix, but just societally men are hypersexual. Women are hyposexual. Women are trained Mm -hmm. not to talk about sex, not to think about it, Mm -hmm. never enjoy it. Like there's no, (laughs) Right. Like, you know, men right, like, yeah. being sexual is endorsed. Women, you know, are, are supposed to be not so much. And so right. that dynamic plays out for people too. And you know what the solution to that is communication, mm-hmm. which it's so funny. Cause I just said this to a couple partners, you just seen their faces. I'm like, you need to talk to him about this. And they're like, what do you mean by that? I'm like, it's just as simple as go talk to him about this. And <laughs> right. they're like, I can't, I'm like, you're going to have to. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to help a whole multitude of things. Just talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, you have to figure out what you like about being with him and then start doing those things and, you know, talking about it so that you're both on the same page. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, you know what I mean? Like you're starting from the very base level. Yeah. Before you even get into the bedroom, you've got to start all this stuff. Yeah, totally. So, and you know, that's what I think is kind of, you know, now is that if more couples could talk about intimacy and sexuality and then like get to a place of vulnerability together. Mm-hmm. And so like, like the gentleman I talked to where he's like, oh no, it was a different gentleman that he's like, you know, I just ended a relationship and porn was definitely a reason that it ended. And he's like, mm-hmm. you know, I don't want to get into another one until I heal this thing because I'm just going to perpetuate it. And that's the reality. Mm-hmm. Like if you go into a relationship pulling it along with you, the whole relationship's distorted. Mm. Mm. Wow. That's, that's really, you know, good nuggets to, to keep even in relationships. I mean, it's so it's amazing how many things that you're like, I'm focusing on porn, but actually this mm-hmm. is almost like a, a relationship, just, you know, handbook almost for people yeah. to enter into healthy relationships. It's, it's not just, you're not just worried about yourself. You know, I think so many people, that's the mis like, um, people get wrong so much of the time is like, oh, porn just is impacting me. It doesn't impact anybody else. I'm, I'm the only one watching it. You know, this doesn't have any impact on my partner, on my family or future relationships. But I mean, exactly what you're saying right there is this guy doesn't even want to get into another relationship because he just knows that that could be a make it or break it for him either way. Yeah. So, yeah. And you know, I'm sure you've, it. I'm sure you've probably seen it online. They call it the silent tsunami. So I talk about mm-hmm. it as the silent tsunami of porn. Like it totally has this negative ripple effect that ripples out to everybody you interact with. And mm-hmm. then the beauty of that is when you leave it behind and heal, it can become this positive force for improvement in all your relationships. And I've been focusing on, I'm adding to my 90, I have a 90 day program, which is a digital program for men. Um, I'm mm-hmm. adding to it a whole module, 10 lessons uh, that I'm calling relationship rewire um, because <laughs> like all, all these men ask me, there's a lesson in there, but it's like one little lesson. And they're all yeah. like, I, how do I get my relationship back on track? Or how do I start a healthy relationship? So, yeah. you know, they've been asking for it. So I've been responding to that, recognizing after you figure out how to, you know, unwire and rewire your brain, then next you have to move into relationships. Yeah, absolutely. So I feel like we obviously understand that porn, you know, is 
causing these physical, you know, medical issues of ED and DE. But I feel as if when I'm doing research on, on this type of stuff, a lot of medical doctors aren't really attributing the spike of ED in younger men to pornography. And I don't know if that's really true or not. And if that's the case, why, why are they not addressing this topic? Why aren't they putting the information out there? Do you know? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, my opinion is that, you know, they're not equipped to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So like, if you don't have, from a medical doctor standpoint, if you don't have a solution for that, which all solutions for medical doctors are pharmaceutical. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have a solution then, and they're not taught it. So then Mm -hmm. like, and most men don't tell their medical doctors they have an an issue with porn. It just becomes, Mm -hmm. it's like kind of like ignorance is bliss. Right. And then they just don't know too, because then if they go, if like my clients will tell their medical doctor or they'll go to a urologist for, Mm -hmm. ED and they're like, you know, some medical doctors will tell them porn's good for that. Good for arousal. They just have no clue what's going on in there. And then, you know, like also medical doctors, we know this and hang on. I have to, I don't remember the number of years, but if you look it up, it's like Mm -hmm. medical doctors that are practicing today, Mm -hmm. what they do today is from science from 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. There's a gap. They call it. It's like a gap. And if you Google it, you'll just find that number right away. There's like a gap in medical doctors are using technology and ideas from 20 years ago. So, you know, 20 years ago, we didn't know that much right now. We're still in the midst of figuring it out. So it's just old thought systems also in allopathic medicine. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I'll, you know, just do a basic Google search and I'll say, you know, what, I'm just trying to find the root, you know, why is this happening in younger men? And I mean, at the core of me, I do know that it is pornography causing these medical issues, but I just want to see, yeah, is that what other people believe? Is that what uh, that information that's being pushed out there? And I'll read articles and it's just kind of a blanket statement of, yeah, you know, the, the, age range of men suffering from ED now is just, you know, increasingly getting a little bit younger. And that's kind of all that that it is. And so I didn't know if that's just them being like willfully ignorant or if that's just them not putting in the time or effort, they're not really aware of what's going on. Well, I think it's also, I wouldn't say it's willful ignorance. It's just Mm -hmm. ignorance. Like, Mm -hmm. and also like, you know, medical doctors never read science except for, Mm -hmm. you know, MD, PhD. So like, going to the science isn't necessarily mm-hmm. a thing any practicing medical doctor would naturally do just, you know what I mean? Right. So, and this is the skill. And, you know, I've been a scientist for a very long time. And so my scientific mind just does this, which medical doctors minds probably don't. So like, and I would encourage you to do it because a, it's super fun. <laughs> right. And two, it's, uh, it's what you need to do to, mm-hmm. to be able to make these correlations is like, if you put If you find 10 studies that you can all link together, you don't need a study that goes ED in young men is caused by porn. If you have five of them that you can connect the dots between, which, you know, I've done that in a lot of studies. And then, uh, you know, a medical doctor will say to me, there's no study that says this. I'm like, but there's five that go together that equal that, you know, I can't Mm -hmm. think of a great example now, but like you can do that. I know there's a study on porn, there's a couple of studies on porn use and erectile dysfunction. Um, but you know, I was looking at masturbation is one thing that I mm-hmm. was looking at the science, maybe like six months, a year ago now. And that's one example where it was showing the difference between masturbation and sex with a partner. And mm-hmm. it was looking at prostate cancer because you know a lot of men will go I have to masturbate because I don't want prostate cancer which is ridiculous to me so like I was looking across the science and it's like all you have to do is connect the you know the gaps between these three studies and it's super clear that and actually what the study showed is men who had healthy sex frequently Mm -hmm. had less risk of prostate cancer when they were older Mm -hmm. but masturbation not so much you know, so like, you just have to be able to look and, and, you know, do your literature review, but then be able to make hypotheses based upon not one science, 
scientific study that's out there, but the corpus of literature, that's why you're doing a lit review. Right, absolutely. Well, and that's interesting that you're talking about the, the cancer because I feel like the main thing that we know is like pornography can cause ED and D, you know, those are like the main things that will come up. But I was wondering, are there cases where you're saying pornography is actually causing cancer? You know, can you, can we make a correlation based off of that? Or is it too, do we not have enough information on that yet? You know, it's too much of a leap for me to right. say that, but here's what I can tell you. And we're going right. to connect some dots. Yeah. So, and you might've heard me say this, but I'll outline it a little differently. So, you know how on the front of the Cheerio box, it says, um, will reduce cholesterol. Do you yeah. know what I'm talking about? If you look at yes. the front mm -hmm. of Honey Nut Cheerios, which has tons of sugar in it, it says reduces mm -hmm. cholesterol as part of a balanced diet. Like that's literally off the chain that Honey Nut Cheerios reduces cholesterol. It has no hope of reducing cholesterol. Mm -hmm. But right. what the reason they're able to put it on the front of the box is because consuming whole grains as part of a balanced diet is, mm -hmm. is healthy for you. Okay, yep. so with that idea, that vein mm -hmm. of idea, is that we know it's proven that stress causes cancer. We know that stress, mm -hmm. cancer, that's been proven lots of times. Mm -hmm. What I know about the pendulum brain that I already explained to you is a stressed out brain. Too much fast energy is stress and anxiety. Mm -hmm. So the more you consume pornography, the more you're keeping your brain in the pendulum brain, the more you're stressing it out, you're taxing your entire system. That's why mm -hmm. neurotransmitters are messed up. That's why hormones aren't flowing like they should. So that chronic behavior is chronically stressing out your nervous system and chronic stress leads to cancer. So all we have to do is close two gaps there to, to say that if you consume pornography frequently, consistently, and especially with intensity, then intensity because of the dopamine levels, you're just mm. really maxing a system out, then you are putting yourself more at risk for, you know, a, a brain pattern that can attract to you dis-ease because it's disease. Your, if right. your system is at dis-ease, then yeah. you're not at ease. And a system mm -hmm. not at ease is the one that gets cancer. Mm, it's going to break down and it probably you can make that correlation to a lot of different other medical, you know, impacts later down the line. I mean, with that, with that type of correlation, I feel like that just opens the door to so many other things, you know, it's not just one thing. You're not just, uh, you know, saying, well, pornography is only going to impact me this one way. It's basically opening a whole door of possibilities. Yeah. Like, you know, I know I looked at one scientific study that more than one, but one in my mind that connects mm -hmm. porn use to dementia, which, mm -hmm. you know, again, if you think about it and, you know, I know the brain, I know the electrical, the EEG brain pattern behind dementia. Like basically mm -hmm. if you're taxing the system, you're going to drop the power in the brain. That's what the dementia is a lower powered brain that's using too much slowing. So we know porn makes your brain use too much slowing and it's, it's sucking the power out of it. And again, they don't know in, in some of the science, they don't know if it's a chicken or an egg effect because people with dementia will like, there's a few clients that I have where they keep getting caught watching porn and wow. they likely had a porn habit before they got dementia. And that mm. is their way to regulate, but wow. there's studies that show that dementia and porn use are linked. Wow. That's amazing. Now, what would you say? I mean, I guess if these things are beyond just a man, you know, this isn't just a man's issue of dementia or cancer. So there, I mean, that could show up in a woman too. I, are there anything, is there anything specific that a woman can see physically changing or medical issues? Because I feel like a lot of this is driven for men. And obviously I would say more men, or there's the common ideology that more men watch pornography than women, but definitely you know, that's proven like it right men that's changing unfortunately for mm -hmm. our society but um absolutely like at current rates right now men but you know like women actually have more risk of dementia but also it's been proven that women's brains are more stressed out than men's like mm -hmm. taking porn out of the formula because none of those studies like how cool how interesting would it be if you went to every single you know EEG or psychological and just included porn as a variable. Ask all the, ask all the 
participants or subjects, do you watch porn? And likely yeah. any, likely any of those studies, 75% of the male subjects watch porn. That's just like, or, more, or, or higher. So like, if you think of it in that way, like mm -hmm. all of our studies are skewed because we don't know the impact of porn on, right. on all these other findings. And we're, cause we're not asking those questions. And I, you know, is the, is the reason we're not asking that question back to the whole reason is just because we're not aware of that's something we should be asking, or is it because it's associated with this guilt or shame type of culture that you don't even want to address it? Like maybe the doctors or other people struggle with it. So they don't want to, they don't want to have to 100%. ask themselves. Yeah. It, it's like hundred percent because I, I don't, I used to talk about porn all the time and I quickly learned people won't come near me if I use the word porn. And actually right now, cause I have mold poisoning. It is so funny because mold is just like porn. Nobody wants to talk yeah. about mold because molds in just like everybody's house. And right. if I tell you, and so is porn, porn's in just by everybody's house. Mm. So if I go mold was in my walls in my house, I didn't know it's been kicking my booty for years without me knowing uh -huh. like you should have your house checked for mold. People will be like this. <laughs> and then <laughs> no, when, no. I, when I go, you know what porn's impacting you know, your husbands, your kids, your pastors, nobody mm. wants to know that because that's a big thing to know. And as soon yeah. as you know, now you got to do something about it. First of all, people don't mm. want to know because that's terrifying. And secondly, mm. they don't know what to do about it. So like, I don't necessarily, it's like, it's interesting. It's a psychological process in that mm. it's so mm -hmm. big to look at that society doesn't want to, and people don't want to, it's a big thing. And I get it. And, you know, yeah. I take a lot of flack for, for talking about it and absolutely, you know, I, and it's like, I feel like I need to. So here I am, you know, absolutely. I mean, I'm a young person and people ask me, what do you do? And I said, well, I try to go general first. I don't just jump in and say, I'm writing a book about porn, you know? <laughs> and so, but it'll be funny. They're trying to make a conversation with me and I'll be like, well, I do writing. And they're like, what do you write? And I'm like, well, I'm writing a book. And they're like, what is it? It's yeah. funny. People will make assumptions. They're like, you're yelling. It's like a children's book. And I'm like, well, not yeah. quite. You know, yeah, my yeah. husband's in the background. He's chuckling. He's like, it's not yeah. a children's book. Totally, and, I know. And then, you know, I, you're, trying to find the best ways to be like okay how can I tell them that I'm writing a book about porn it's not erotica it's uh -huh. factual you know it's uh -huh. the facts uh -huh. I'm presenting but as soon as you say that to people they just automatically shut off and they're like how can I get out of this conversation because this is uncomfortable yeah yep. so I, I know it's so I, funny because I, 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 I go I help people they go what do you do and I'm like I help people with attention anxiety and internet addictions and mm. then and they'll be like, internet addictions, how interesting. And then my best friend will be in the background. She'll be, she'll be like, don't let her kid you. She's one of the foremost experts on porn. And then they, <laughs> they, sc they scatter though. Nobody wants to talk to me about it. They liked right. it better when I was talking about, you know, screen time and, mm. um, you know, social media, like that's easier for people to wrap their minds around than they can you know, get behind porn. that. They're like, oh yeah, that's not taboo at all. That's just common knowledge. But yeah, but I, so this is so interesting to me is that people can't even hear the word porn. Mm -hmm. So we know that most relationships are being impacted by it. And right. the word porn is kind of scary and people can't even like have it come out of their mouth, except for most of those people's partners. If they knew what that porn actually was, mm -hmm. they I, would literally die. Like the word itself is terrifying enough to articulate. And even for me, because it's so funny because I've, or interesting, I guess not funny, but you know, I've learned to throw the words porn, ejaculation, erection, masturbation. Like, mm -hmm. you know, my husband would be like, stop saying that so loud. Cause if we're out now, I'm just like, you know, the, cause the words right. have become desensitized. But mm -hmm. like, when you realize what, what the porn is that most people are watching, it's so bad for them. Like the word doesn't even do it justice. You know what I mean? Right. It's just, it's such a weak word compared to the, it's a whole world, you know, it's a world that they're living inside, Yeah, you know, their phone screens, computer screens, whatever it is. So I, I totally agree. And that's the, And for people most that, people, it's pretty dark. Like for most people, it's a pretty dark experience or it doesn't feel dark in the moment because the distorted thought system, but like it creates it's definitely not light. It's darkness, you know. No. And it's so easy to get into, as, you know, as you mentioned earlier, just different type of genres. I mean, it just you flip over that edge. 
And that's what one of our chapters we were discussing about is about the dark web. And, you know, you hear about the dark web, you're like, oh, well, I don't watch the, you know, I don't go on the dark web, you know, that's just seems so far removed from our society. But I'm like, no, it's like, the next step after you watch hardcore porn, you're already practically in the dark web, because what else is going to satisfy your brain? I mean, you're just preparing it to want more and more and more. It's craving it. So the next thing is to go into, you know, child porn or whatever it is, you know? Yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of people then just go act it out with other human beings that are emotionally unhealthy, like, you know, prostitution, escorts, Um, you know, things that people never conceptualize them, never saw themselves doing. And they'll be like, I don't even know how I got here. I'm like, I do. It's called escalation. Right. Yeah. It's, you get to that point. And I think people that don't really, they don't watch porn. And when you don't watch porn, you're so far removed because you don't want to step into that. You don't, you don't even want to flirt with that temptation, you know, per se. So you don't even want to educate yourself on it. So it's just, you kind of see this divided line between people that would say, oh my goodness, nobody in my world would ever watch that or be a part of that. And then yeah. there's the other person that's secretly like, yeah, it's been there, done that, already doing it, you know? It's, totally, exactly. It's like and violence, like, it's just a, like, what happens for me is like, when I, I don't watch the news, but when anything comes my way of violence is like, right. I look to see if that person watches porn. Because right. people who are, you know, doing violent acts, many of them, it's, you know, there's porn in their background. It's wild. Mm-hmm. It's wild. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And that's something that we did include in our book too about Ted Bundy. I mean, he was, mm-hmm. he admitted to it. He was like, well, I can't, I can't say porn was by, you know, the overall arching end all be all, but he was like, that's how I started these really vindictive behaviors, how I kind of yep. had a really violent behavior pattern. I was mm-hmm. like, well, that was before internet porn. That's just what seeing something in a magazine, you know? Definitely. So, yeah. That, that guy, I now. don't know that. I don't know the guy's name, but the guy who killed all those people in the massage parlor and they were saying it was an Asian hate um, crime Yeah. where, I don't know if you remember it. Um, I had COVID when it was, so it was two marches ago. Cause I remember it. And mm-hmm. it, um, it, he said that he, you know, had to make the voices stop, like basically, because he mm. was going to that massage parlor for sexual experiences, and mm. he was just trying to make it stop. Right. Distorted thought system, you know, it's terrible for people. Mm. It's just amazing how it goes from one thing, you think it's so small, and so just, all, it's a lifetime, it's a lifetime of hurt and healing, and, you know, I, what you're doing is rewiring, you know, taking control of your brain again, so, and it's, not an overnight process. No. And, but, you know, to, I guess just to put a bow on all that darkness ourselves is that (laughs) like, what I also know is that when people do get into a program, so I can just talk about mine, when they get Mm -hmm. into a program that helps them succeed, they feel better than they ever have because their brains aren't going back to where it was. Mm -hmm. Their brain is actually becoming healthier than it ever was. And that's a huge right. distinction that I tell people, like you can literally get there. It'll be a different life for you. You've never known your full potential because you've always been holding your brain back with porn. So when you leave porn and you do rewire and you start talking to your partner and you create healthy sexuality, you figure out healthy mood regulation, you do mm-hmm. all these things, like you can have a better life than you ever have and a better relationship and people do. And it's pretty cool because like, you know, if everybody embarked on that journey, then mm. the whole world will be a better place, but especially relationships and families will be better than ever. Oh, absolutely. And I think mm. it is so important to emphasize the positive aspects of it because there's the guilt and shame and you don't want to just focus on the guilt and shame and say, well, you know, that's what porn is. It's like, no, there's a life after porn. There's a whole mind, there's a whole brain, there's a whole body that functions and thrives outside of porn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally, so that's totally. So important to add, you know, I feel like it's such a doom and gloom conversation because people are scared of it, but it's like, oh, no, there's, it's, this is why we can still have, you know, not serious conversations. We can still be lighthearted at the end of the day because we know the help. Totally, know, it's you like know. you've been, you know, that's why I tell people like, it, honestly, it's not even your fault. You were a kiddo when this thing started. So like, like, that has been your life. But once you take the first step, like your mm-hmm. life gets better right away. Like it gets a little right. hard for most people at the very beginning in the unwire mm-hmm. rewire process. But then from mm-hmm. there on out, like you don't have to be fully, fully 
you know, healed for that momentum to begin. It's like the beginning is the, you know, we always joke, my husband, and I joke, it's the first day of the rest of your life when you, uh, sorry, my dot, my precious daughter's calling me over and over and over. So uh, <laughs> she's 17. It's like, Aww. if I don't answer, she just keeps calling. I just sent her the message. Uh, I can't talk right now. Right. So um, yeah. So, you know, there's hope there's, you know, pragmatic hope you have to do the work, but if you do the work, you mm -hmm. can totally get there. Absolutely. That's amazing. Well, that basically was a lot of my questions that I had and you answered them all. So that was amazing. And this yeah, has been cool. a lot of great information for me. Thank you. Yeah, sweet. No problem. What's your uh, time frame? What are you looking at? Are you how far so, are you? Are you done with your book? So right now, so Dr. Reisman, she, when she started the book, just to give you a quick overview, it's kind of mm -hmm. a generational book. It's we're talking about the past, present and what the future of pornog pornography is going to mm -hmm. look like. And mm -hmm. so she wrote the past and then I'm picking up in the present, which is, you know, she was like, this is it. When, before she passed away, she was like, this is amazing. Cause I was helping her do the research. She was like, you're basically a part of the Gen Z, you know, mm -hmm. generation. She was like, you can mm -hmm. actually talk about this with authority also of like what you see in your people, you know, the people around mm -hmm. you. So mm -hmm. I'm writing these chapters about the present right now. And I'll finish up the book with, you know, what the future of pornography is going to be. And then I'll do end. We're going to have like the hope and that, that, you know, there is, there is a life after porn. We're going to include that. Yeah. So right now I've written, this is on, on my fourth chapter. So eight chapters in total have been written and cool. we're about, I think 14 or 15 chapters is our goal for this book. So, mm -hmm. you know, roughly ha halfway ish, you know, a little bit more than halfway done at this book. So yeah, that's yeah it's right interesting because I have five kids that are teenagers so like living with five teenagers is interesting for me because it's like I get a peek into how they all use their technology which is totally different than my husband and I use technology mm -hmm. scary and <laughs> and like knowing what I know also about like dating apps and all of those things and the mm -hmm. future of porn what do you have your future of porn like um outlined uh, yet I, yes I do I just a little bit of the future of porn is virtual reality robots um, deep fakes, um, you know, a lot of just technology is really going to propel that. You know, it is. It's much. terrible. And if you're up for a suggestion, there is yeah. like keeping our discussion in mind mm -hmm. of keeping our, like, I would also include in their escort services, mm -hmm. you know, prostitution, mm -hmm. because what keeping in mind our conversation of arousal dysfunction because mm. porn's creating all this arousal dysfunction. And what we know, I know there's studies out there that show that young men are preferring porn over having girlfriends and being like more college mm -hmm. guys are just consuming porn and not even trying to be with women. Or if they do, mm -hmm. it's just hookup culture. Right. And it has to be, and one guy put it this way, this is a really good story where he's like, I really like this girl and I couldn't be with her, but he could be with girls that he was just hooking up with because there was no intimacy. Mm -hmm. When intimacy, intimacy entered, that's when mm -hmm. the arousal issues would fire up. He's like, why? He's, he was this young guy, he's like 19. He was like, I don't get it. I can be with this girl if I'm just kind of like using her for sex. Super cute kid, you know? <laughs> I think yeah. it's so cute. Like the kid, kid gets out of call and he's like asking me and I'm like, you know, <laughs> right. and, uh, but, I, but I know the science behind it where I'm like, you know, it's because you like her. And so yeah. he couldn't get aroused because he liked her. If he was just using her as a sexual object, mm -hmm. he could be aroused. So like thinking into the future of pornography, the reason people go to escorts is because like, you know, I work with married men that use escorts and it's because mm -hmm. they can't get their partners to do those unhealthy acts that they have right. seen. So, you know, I would imagine that we're going to see, we're already seeing it. Like, you know, how we're seeing poly relationships are glorified. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If oh, you've I've looked at that. the research, if you looked at the yeah. research on poly, there like there's only one person who's emotionally being served right. by a poly relationship. It's the driver, which is usually the man. Sometimes it's a woman, but mm -hmm. usually it's the man who's just using the multiple women as sexual objects. It's not, you know, there might be some intimacy in the relationship, but not like there would be. Like right. they're proven to be not healthy, you know. So crazy, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I like back to that escort, you know, the future of pornography using, you know, escorts or something. I feel like it's just bringing pornography 
you know, to real life, you know, like that is like the next step is how can you make it even more real? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, yes, you are using a real person, but the key word is using, you're just using them for your fantasies or whatever it is. So yeah. Who do you, who do you imagine? This is one thing I never do just because I know how it goes with the brain of a person who's addicted to porn is I never mention anything they don't know about because as soon as they learn about it, that addicted brain latches onto it and they mm-hmm. want it. Um, right. So I never mention VR. I never mentioned, there's like tools right now that people can buy for masturbation. Like, right. you know, yeah. and I just don't ever, because I know that that is a seed that would be planted mm-hmm. in a man's brain that would then they, the fantasy of it would, really you know, take. just take over. Who do you right. anticipate your audience being? Um, I Very really well. think we do want it to be a lot of younger people. And I think like Elisa Jordheim, she's the one that's helping me write this book. And I, she always is encouraging me to add in the emphasis of just what I know with my generation. So mm-hmm. I, we are anticipating and we're trying to target a younger audience. We don't want this to be, you know, a stuffy book. We kind of want it to be for the layman, you know, not mm-hmm. and pretty easy to read. I mean, it's mm-hmm. not anything that's like oh I'm opening up textbooks over here I'm like okay I can pick it up and I can read a sentence and I can totally absorb it um but of course I think we're anticipating even parents to pick this up and for them to be aware of like oh hold on you know this could be the the reality that I haven't been willing to face you know this might be my teenager this might be actually my grown adult son in his 20s you know so I think we're trying to just get the information out there to whoever is willing to listen to it and yeah, cool. say it and say it in a gentle way, but still be pretty straightforward with yeah, what yeah, out there, yeah, yeah, so, cool. yeah, very yeah. cool, mm-hmm. yeah, awesome. awesome. Thank okay, you. Okay, cool. Yeah, no problem. I'm glad to contribute, and uh, let's stay connected. If there's any, um, you know, anything that else you want to collaborate, I'm always happy to help. Well, thank you so much.